Hello and welcome to the People Grow Places podcast, where we explore the virtuous circle of people, growth and place. Brought to you by Grow Places and hosted by our founder, Tom Larson. Today we've got a really exciting episode and the guest is one of the founding directors of Office S&M Architects, Hugh McEwen. Um, I think you're really going to enjoy this conversation, so stick with us and let's take it away. So Hugh. Welcome to the People Grow Places podcast. Um, how are you doing today? Good, thanks for having me. Good, and thank you for having us at your amazing new office. That's okay. <laughs> uh, showing it off on a really sunny day, which is great. Um, and you've just celebrated your 10 year anniversary, is that right? Yeah, we have, yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, we're planning a plenty of party kind of later in the year as well. Um, but yeah, it's amazing to kind of, we started, you know, evenings and weekends kind of, you know, very organically. And um, yeah, it's kind of surprising to sort of get here, <laughs> get here now, you know. Um, but yeah, a nice feeling, you know. I think you always, um, you always kind of, you know, fear for the worst and hope for the best. And yeah, it's great to kind of get to a, get to a, I suppose, a milestone. But yeah. also still like very much kind of on that journey as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, you've made an amazing start, you know, over, over 10 years, which in architecture is still, you know, a relatively young business, but, yeah. you know, you, you've built some amazing projects and I know there's a lot more to come from you guys. So um, you and Katrina as well, it must feel feel good to have that partnership sort of developing. Yeah, exactly. And I think, um, yeah, then then having a really great team around us and, and sort of, um, yeah, being able to kind of progress things with some really ambitious clients as well, you know, and I think it's, it's that thing of where actually it's, there are so many parts and pieces to a project and I suppose kind of if, if anything over that 10 years has given us a lot more perspective on sort of you know things that have gone really well things that haven't gone so well uh, and actually how how lucky we've been to kind of be in the position that we are uh, and to have completed you know completed some some projects that we're really proud of and work with some people that we're really proud to have worked with. Yeah great so so you mentioned kind of perspective there you know, what take me back a little bit to you know when you were a younger man and you were sort of thinking about getting into working in the built environment and what was kind of what was inspiring you what what's your kind of why to doing what you do yeah i think i've always i've always been really interested in the sort of um the crossover between um uh, sort of i suppose uh, a kind of a more scientific or methodological way of approaching architecture and then a much more kind of artistic approach i think that's kind of always come through in sort of how I've, how I've, you know uh, sort of looked at things, particularly when I was kind of looking to, you know, go into studying architecture um, and sort of seeing that there was quite a kind of technical side to things, but then also uh, something that was much more creative. Um, and I think that that's always kind of been part of when I was studying at Nottingham and then UCL. Um, I was able to kind of, you know, progress and, and develop those those techniques. And then... Um, Myself and Katrina were studying alongside each other at UCL, uh, at the Bartlett in uh, in year twelve, uh, and that's where we where we kind of you know sort of met and started to work alongside each other, both doing projects that had a lot of innovation, both in terms of kind of social programs, but also material and, and architectural uh, sort of outcomes. Uh, they were very colourful, uh, you know, investigated through drawings and models. Um, and so we, we sort of found this natural affinity kind of between what we were doing, what we were interested in and in investigating. Um, and then uh, once we graduated and uh, started out working, we, we started doing kind of projects together and competitions. And that's a sort of snowballed over the, <laughs> over the last few years and you know, leads us to where we are today. Brilliant. And um, something I've always wanted to ask you guys is, you know, sort of, Colour is obviously really present in your work and, and you look back over architectural history, you know, there's some periods where colour was really, really present, but mm. particularly in, you know, the, the UK and sort of the London vernacular, you know, these things have not necessarily explored colour as much as you guys are. Mm. Do you talk to me about that and also, you know, how do you feel, sort of what the human emotion to, you know, does the colour induce, do you think? I think that's really what it comes down to is kind of, you know, what, what's colourful, you know? And I think um, we're really excited of how, you know, as to how colour is used in an architectural sense, and then also how it's used in a in a in a social sense as well. So, you know, from an from an architectural point of view, we we really see colour as a building material. We know that it has um, 
physical effects on our space, uh, on how we perceive buildings and, and the space and space around us. Um, we've, we've done kind of talks and, and sort of lectures around that. Um, and so we use colour to change space uh, in much the same way as we use bricks and mortar. Um, and, you know, that that's, I suppose, what we're, you know, one of the things we're producing as architects is, is space. And, um, and so we see colour as an essential tool in, in our repertoire of being able to um, sort of, you know, affect space and, and, and change space. Um, and so, you know, we even, we even use that in our own office. So, you know, this, this we chose a, a, a rich blue wall here um, because the office is south facing. Uh, so it gets a lot of, uh, of, of, of sunlight kind of during the day. So we wanted to cool that down, uh, which blue does. So the, the, the light reflecting off it kind of becomes more even rather than being so warm. Um, uh, and then also we've, we've kind of complemented that with uh, yellow features and the complementary colours of blue and yellow visually push apart in our, in our brains uh, because we're humans. And um, it means that the space also starts to kind of feel larger and feel wider. So just kind of very small things, um, you know, very, very kind of, you know, it's just two colours, but actually it can start to have a lot of impact on how we perceive, you know, material samples in the office, how uh, we experience kind of day-to-day -day moving around the space as well. And we think that that's kind of a really exciting thing to investigate. And then, you know, the other side, the sort of social side um, that I touched on, I think it's about how colour is very expressive, how it's very personal. And um, we see that as being a really important thing to discuss with our clients. And that's um, from, you know, from, from private homeowners having kind of particular, you know, interests or, or, or kind of wants uh, in terms of colour in their homes um, through to particularly um, public engagement work. So when we're working on, on public realm uh, or uh, you know, engagement projects, colour becomes a really amazing tool to talk with people and give people confidence in, in expressing what they've always wanted to sort of see in their, in their area. And um, that's, that's where that kind of idea of um, something, yeah, colour being very personal becomes really exciting because it can be personal to so many different people and people see things in different ways and have different different opinions. Um, but it's a medium to then have that conversation and to sort of start to put that um, that personality into into the public realm. Um, and so, yeah, we, we're, we're doing things, you know, we, we uh, do a lot of um, co-design work, co-making um, and... Uh, using using kind of color as a as a discussion point, so through through those uh, through those workshops and those methods becomes really amazing, um, and we can then start to translate that into the final pieces that are produced very directly as well. So we can show this 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 clear link through uh, through that co making process into the final things that are installed in, in the public realm, and so um, yeah, we see we see this ability for color to then be very personal and that. Then be represented directly into the you know the finished outcome as being a really amazing way of having that having that individuality shown in in the final work that, that that's being produced. Yeah, thank you. And, and as you say, like something that I've always you know thought about when I think about your work and when we've spoken is is that element of you know you being obviously obviously the architect, but very much this kind of community led co design and co creation side of things and. Um, you know, marrying that with colour theory um, and, and, and different sort of approaches to colour, you, you must see that when you're talking to the community, you know, maybe you've got an impression about what what colours may make a space feel a certain way, but you speak to different members of, of society, different races, different ages, um, different perspectives, as you mentioned, and I'm sure they have a very different view on on what they think of a certain colour inducers or a certain space feels like and Completely. that must be quite a, a nice process to go through. Yeah it is and I, I think it really shows that there's yeah that, you know it's just one example of kind of where that power of collaboration and communication kind of can have really amazing outcomes and that you know sometimes those things can be antagonistic but actually people can sort of see that as a positive as well you know we had one project where uh, you know it's a palette of colours and one person, you know, in the in the steering group looks at it and goes, "Oh wow, that's a uh, that's like a, a peacock, and that's just right for this area." You know, we really want it to be, you know, 
X, Y, and Z. And then somebody else looks at it and goes, oh, you know, it really reminds me of an oil slick. And that's <laughs> perfect because that's really, you know, X, Y, you know. Yeah. And so, so diff- different, you know, people can look at things and also have their own opinions, but come to this, you know, uh, sort of, uh, you know, democratic agreement as to kind of, you know, uh, an outcome as well. So it's, it's, I think it's great in terms of its directness, you know, um, and, and, and sort of, and the ability to, you know, a lot of, a lot of the work we do is about kind of empowering that decision making um, and sort of building that capacity for them being able to, you know, deliver, deliver those, those projects. And um, I think handling tools that are very, you know, very, very, um, you know, you know, have a, have a lot of have a, have a lot of power to them, um, and 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 um, you know, uh, putting those in the hands of the community to then design with is 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 really powerful. You know, um, and so if we can set up a framework and set up a, a, a sort of uh, you know a methodology to then to to be delivering those those co-designed outcomes, yeah, we think that that color is a really incredible tool for for doing that. Yeah, and obviously, you know, colour is a big element of your work. But it's not, you know, it's not the, the only thing that, that was the first thing that kind of comes to mind because <laughs> because the, the colours are often so bold. But you know, you're you're exploring different materials, you're exploring, you know, different different patterns and, and the way that they impact not only the interior but also the exterior of the architecture. And um, how's that? How's that kind of dialogue go with with when we talk about the the outside of the building in kind of urban context? You know, how how, how do you find that sort of uh, side of the discussion, maybe with the local authority or or, or with community groups, etc. Yeah, I think then it, it really does shift into into like you say materiality. I think we always see um, color and material as sort of almost one and the same thing. You know, commonly we're we're working with self colored materials or through colored materials. Um, so um, yeah, sort of generally, you know, the, the the proposals that we're making are not sort of a painted finish. They are actually physically kind of a part of the material, and so in that, some of those considerations around color start to cross over into things like character or context, and um, that's really exciting for us. And um, we we think that sort of um, you know engaging with the character of the place um, is is really an opportunity to kind of design from that and design something which is part of a part of a place, um, and hopefully. Hopefully, you know, an improvement, a positive impact, you know, there. Um, and I think we're, um, you know, we're, we're sometimes um, a bit on the fence around, you know, some ideas of, 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 of context um, because sometimes, uh, you know, uh, contextual approaches, should we call them, are, um, you know, not the best we can do. And um, I think that sort of we're, we're, um, looking at kind of what are the best bits of the place? How can we kind of have have um, how can we kind of curate something or sort of take the best pieces of a of a of a place and do something that that improves on that and builds on that and isn't necessarily just a reductive you know kind of pastiche or or kind of um, uh, yeah an outcome that kind of isn't the best it can be. Um, so I think that's where and you know materials are kind of a key part of some of the you know the characters of places often get lost you know we've, we've talked a lot um, recently about kind of vernacular material and actually how vernacular material is very much linked to the place and the materials there um, and then that starts to build up a character you know it's to do with the technology of building the availability of materials and the conditions of the, the sort of weather and so um, using using you know uh, you know investigating and researching um, you know, vernacular materials can actually turn out some sort of unexpected results because sometimes um, there's just been an assumed kind of approach to uh, a particular place, a, a sort of steamrollering of a kind of, you know, a, a, an artificial vernacular, um, quite often a, a sort of a, a brick vernacular. And, um, you know, we're then sort of looking for, well, that, that might not be what was what was there originally. And... Um, and, and sort of seeing how we can maybe suggest something that's more appropriate. Right, yeah. And that really comes across, I think, in your, in your work and, and the project you've got on the drawing board as well, you know, really kind of, you can see there's a very clear thread that goes through your work, but equally each one's, you know, there's, they've got differences in responding to, to the local, local needs of the place. Mm-hmm. And I think that's really great. 
Um, so kind of like taking a bit of a step back from your kind of your buildings and, and you know, the architecture side of things for a minute, uh, you know, uh, in terms of you personally, you know, obviously running a, running a small business uh, over the course of 10 years is, is a great achievement, um, particularly doing it in architecture, which is kind of notoriously um, a strain on, on you, a strain on your kind of your, your life in general. And um, so what, what drives you on a kind of personal level to, to do what you do? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think um, I think I think kind of on a personal, you know, from a personal point of view, I think it's you know it's kind of enjoyment of being here and kind of the moment and uh, you know making the most of that to a certain extent. You know, I think um, really enjoy being you know in London and working in London and you know the the amazing um, city that we're kind of in. Um, and uh, you know, I think I think that's um, you know that in some way, you know, is both what I I enjoy kind of at the weekend, and I enjoy it sort of during you know during the week and you know working in this context as well. Um, I think it's um, yeah, just a city that's so uh, so so mixed, so um, yeah, so much going on, so much you know. And, and, and also a huge amount of change. You know, it, it's something that's kind of never sitting still. Um, and I think the opportunity of kind of doing things that are both um, responding to the kind of, uh, sort of the people and, uh, and, and places that exist in the city um, and are, um, you know, sort of res- are responding and for, you know, for and by those people is, is really, uh, yeah, a, a real kind of, Honor and opportunity. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if that answers your question, but yeah, it does. It does. Um, yeah, it's exactly that, isn't it? And it, it's something, you know, it's something that's greater than yourself, and it's an you know, yeah. element of service in it. And I think that you know really comes across in in what you're doing. So, mm. you know, thank you for sharing that and you know taking the time today to to have a chat with us. And <laughs> just to, you know, obviously, you know, one final sort of thought for me is kind of you know, what what if anything are you you know, you're personally, professionally kind of sort of grappling with at the moment that's sort of taking up your your headspace and uh, that you're trying to get over at the moment? I might, I might flip that into kind of what opportunities we see, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I think um, in some way, I don't know, one of the things that we're sort of seeing at the moment um, as being quite exciting is, is this kind of... Um, you know, a, a reconnection between kind of the public and the private, you know, and I think an understanding that kind of uh, local authorities can't do it on their own. Uh, and at the same time, um, you know, uh, not just a new breed of property developer, but but actually kind of across the board, um, there being much more focus on kind of, you know, um, public good being delivered um, for, for, you know, in pla- you know, for places and for people. And so I think that that kind of combination is, is starting to yield some really, really interesting results. Um, and, we, you know, we're doing various pieces of kind of strategy work um, and, and also obviously kind of, you know, built projects as well. And I think more and more of those, it's really this understanding of kind of, you know, how can, how can kind of everyone be brought to the table and, and how can kind of positives, you know, come, come out of that process. Um, so, so I think, you know, that is maybe the result of some, some, Things that people are grappling with from from you know um, from from you know different sectors, but I think actually there's the possibility of kind of seeing some really positive you know outcomes of that. Um, and uh, yeah, but it's a I think it's it's a different way of working. You know, it's sort of um, it, it, it's it's something which I which I think kind of need, needs a, a, you know cooperation, um, but has you know has amazing benefits for 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 everyone. You know. For the, but, but for particularly for the places in which you know these these projects happen, um, so you know we're, we're seeing that 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 is kind of being you know led on both sides. I think you know we're seeing local authorities maybe kind of pushing policies and being able to support things like community wealth building and kind of other other sort of locally organised policies. And then you know we're seeing um, developers also wanting to deliver on you know ESG and, and kind of actually how. Um, how how developments kind of meet into an area 
um, maintaining contacts, you know, developing those those things further as well. So, um, yeah, it's, it's I think it's really really interesting. And then you've got then you've got kind of organisations sort of starting to sit sit you know between the two, um, which are which are being pushed at various levels. So, I think there's some really interesting kind of possibilities from that. Um, but I, but it's a space that's kind of you know I think I think being still being worked through. So um, yeah, I'd say that, that that's my that's my kind of uh, thing to grapple with. Yeah, no, and I totally agree. You know, I think it's a really exciting time to be, you know, working in, in the built environment at the moment. And it does feel like, you know, public and private sector, although obviously with differences of opinions and, and different drivers um, on certain things, there's there's a real collaboration now and, and, and a lot of kind of shared values and shared agendas there, um, which is only going to strengthen projects and, and strengthen places, really. Yeah. Um, that's probably a good place to leave it, but thank you very much for your time today. And I'm um, delighted for having you on the podcast. Yeah, thanks very much. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the People Grow Places podcast. For more information, visit growplaces.com and follow us at We Grow Places across all social channels. See you next time.